So, the first thing I want you to take a look at is back this repeating motif. Now you have a, a motif of a triad. So right here in the, in the center you see Shakyamuni Buddha, and then he has two other figures. Right? So he's in the center and one, two. And then if you bring your eye up to the top up above him, another repeat. So there's one figure directly above him and then one on either side. And then if you bring your eye to the left, you see another triad. So the right, that same repeating thing. Kind of, let's ignore these guys on the side for just now. And then come down to the right and you see another set of three. Another set of three, one, two, three. And another set of three, one, two, three. Now, lots and lots of meaning just in the one, two, three. We could talk about, hmm, the three represent the Buddha, which is codenamed for, you know, the enlightened teacher of the Dharma, meaning the teachings of enlightenment, and the Sangha, meaning the gathering of enlightenment. So we can talk about it in that way. We can talk about it as different aspects of um, enlightenment. We can talk about it as compassion, wisdom, and power. So we can, we can look at it as the sets of three, but for now we're going to look at it as teachers and students. And then we're maybe going to talk about some of the, the actual implements that they're using and what these things might mean. So the very first thing I want you to look at is the main central figure, and it's Shakyamuni Buddha. Now Shakyamuni is a, a Sanskrit term. Shakya is a claim. It's a from ancient India 2,500 years ago. Muni is a, a title, it actually means the sage. Or literally it means quiet, the person that's quiet. So sometimes you'll see it translated as the silent one of the shakyas. Now, Buddha himself wasn't silent, he obviously spoke, but it's the idea that somebody has a certain insight, you know, that maybe is not so easily uh, conferred via words. So it's Shakya Muni, he's the historical Buddha. He's the one that, you know, if you're reading a textbook about Buddhism, He's the guy that started that, that thing that we now call Buddhism. Now, if you pay attention to his hands, remember I said that each, each little aspect has a certain meaning. This is represented no place uh, more, I would say, subtly but also effectively than in the hand positions. So in the hand positions, they're actually called mudras, M-U-D-R-A-S, if you're taking notes. Mudra, it literally means a seal, like a stamp, you're stamping something. But it, in this context, it means you're, what you're doing with your hands. And what you're doing with your hands is actually um, very closely connected with, oftentimes, with legendary events connected with the figures of lifetime. But also, it has very specific internal and external means. In fact, it's so specific that you can, you can figure out who somebody is just based on their hand positions. We were just having a discussion. Tasha, the artist and I were just having a discussion about you know, who is who, and we're talking about hand positions. So it, they become emblematic of these deeper meanings that become associated with the figures themselves. So if you see his hands are in, one hand is in what's called a, a meditative echo voice, mudra. So one hand is here, down here like this. It's the same, it's half of this, this mudra. And the other hand is out on his knee, and it's touching down to the earth. It's actually, it, it literally is touching the earth, even though it's not, it's not clear necessarily there. Now, there's a legendary component to this. Um, and I mean legendary in the sense that it's associated with his lifetime, right? So there's a story. I mean, you, sometimes they, they call it a mythological component. It doesn't mean it's a myth. It just means that it, it has, there's a story component to it. And the story is that before Buddha was, Buddha literally means the awakening translated as the enlightenment. But before he was the Buddha, he was just, you know, a human being. And he went through the practices and he attained enlightenment. So, right before that enlightenment point, there was um, a kind of a challenge from Mara, who, Mara is a Sanskrit term, it gets translated as demon or devil, but actually it's cognate with death. And I like it, uh, murtya in Sanskrit. And I like to think of it as limitations. Sometimes we think of it as ego. Because it's not, it's not like this bad guy over there. It's actually this sense of limitations that I have. It's what's holding me back from realizing who I truly am. That's Mara. So the story goes that Mara, you know, Buddha's Mara, got a little bit, uh, he knew Buddha was getting close to enlightenment. So he tried all these wily coyote moves to try to get him to not attain enlightenment. One of which he sent his very seductive daughters to go try to 
disrupt him from meditation. It didn't work. Then he sent, he had his army of demons and monsters and stuff shoot arrows at him, and that didn't work. Buddha just sat there peacefully, and as the weapons fell down on him, he perceived it as a rain of flowers because he had already conquered his aggression. So he'd already conquered his uh, clinging, his desire, and then his aggression. So finally, Mara's given a little bit, you know, I guess, freaked out. What I would call. <laughs> and he goes, he goes to Buddha, and they have this interesting dialogue. Um, it very, very interesting. But but the gist of it at the end, he sort of says, "Well, what gives you the right? What what makes you think you're so special and good to attain enlightenment? What have you done in the past to lead up to this point?" And I forget Buddha's exact or Siddhartha's exact response, but then he sort of think Mara thinks he has him and says, Well, who's your witness? You know, who's who's gonna vouch for you? As if, you know, might they need somebody to witness it. But still Buddha was kind of playing along. And and Buddha at that moment touches the earth. He breaks his meditation, he was in a meditation posture, he breaks his meditation posture, touches the earth. And he says, The earth itself is my witness. And then depending on the the text that you read, some texts say earthquake happens, and then some texts say like the goddess of the earth comes out and says, "Yep, <laughs> <laughs> he did, he did it, Mara." Uh, so, so at that time, Mara is clearly defeated. You know, Buddha has, or what will be the Buddha in a short time, defeats that enemy of limitations, and then is free to then glimpse who he truly is, the true reality of his own nature. And so that evening, he attained. So that's a legend, right? So, that, so that's what it means in terms of why that particular figure, Shakyamuni Buddha, is doing the Earth Touching Mudra. But if you look at it from an iconographical perspective, let's just take, let's just take one, one of the three or even nine potential iconographical perspectives. We can divide him up. We can divide him up and say, well, in every Tibetan, uh, every piece of Tibetan art, for the most part, you could say that the right side represents compassion. Now, compassion is very is has a very specific meaning. It means wanting to help people uh, relieve their suffering. So, helping people relieve their suffering. So, being active, going out. The left side represents wisdom, and wisdom also has a very specific meaning. It means uh, being in touch with one's true nature or independent interdependence. Um, that one is that we were discussing. Now, the, the thing to remember is that these things, even though we're going to divide it for iconographical purposes, they're not separate. Wisdom is actually, I mean, wisdom is compassion. If you have compassion without wisdom, you're going to burn yourself out. If you have uh, wisdom without compassion, it becomes a very dry, sort of stale separation. So the two are, are very similar. One leads to the other, and one creates the other. So, if we were to divide it up that way, we can see that, oh, well, on his left side, if we just look at his hands, we can say that he's holding meditative equipoise, meaning that, oh, he's sort of maintaining a, a, an evenness in his realization. And at the same time, he's reaching out and touching the ground and calling the earth to witness. He's reaching out for that stability, and he's, he's like giving stability out to the world, literally touching the earth, literally sending out in the earth. So it's both together. He's giving us, that, that becomes the teaching. You know, not to have what um, Shogun Trungpa Rinpoche like to call idiot compassion. The kind of compassion that's like, oh, you know, I become a doormat or something. So, if we look even further, we could say, well, his, both his legs are connected. So, wisdom and compassion are sort of folded in. He's sitting in what most people call the lotus posture. It's actually technically here called the Vajra posture. Immovable. Unbreakable. True reality posture. Yes, yeah, very Exactly. Some of us can do it in meditation. I can do it for about 10 seconds. Um, sometimes called a painful posture. <laughs> it's not, not real. Um, so we see that here, so that's just one, one particular layer. But if we go back to the teachers and transmissions, let's look at who his main students are. So we go over here to Shari Putra, literally the son of Shar. And Shari Putra is... Um, the man, he was literally Shakyamuni Buddha's right hand disciple. He was the main disciple. He was the one that's he's featured in some of these um, the Perfection of Wisdom Sutra. Some of you have probably read the Heart Sutra, which he is a key figure in that. Um, and he was known as somebody who 
if we're, if we're taking the compassion side of things, he was always available to teach. Even when he himself, interestingly, hadn't yet digested the message, he still was able to teach because he had, he had mastered the teaching so well, he could teach at a level that was beyond even his own uh, realization, which is a fascinating possibility, but we'll leave that for now. And then on this side is Mongalian. Um, there are lots of different spellings, but he it was well known for his attainment of a kind of clairvoyance. And clairvoyance, as we know in French, is like a clear sight. And along with that, clairvoyance become all kinds of like magical powers and things like that. So right there, there's a transmission. There's main figure teacher, you know, and actually one of the epithets of Shakyamuni Buddha is uh, the great teacher. And he gave his transmission to these two main disciples. They're not the only people that got the transmission. And by transmission, I mean a kind of, um, a kind of insight or a kind of realization that's passed from teacher to disciple. Are we all pretty clear on that? We, don't, we may not know exactly what that realization is or we may have words around it, but there's something that gets passed, a kind of insight, sort of like, um, almost like lighting a fire. Right, so I light a candle from somebody else, and then it spreads. doesn't mean that I, if I light one fire, then my fire goes out. I can light many fires. But in Buddhism in general, and Tibetan Buddhism in very much in particular, it's incredibly important if you're a teacher to be able to trace your lineage back all the way to the historical Buddha 2,500 years ago, give or take. So that lineage component is very much um, a concern. It, it, it's what sets up authentic teachers and authentic students because even without that sort of passing of the fire there's not there's you go into the dangerous territory of maybe or maybe not it's in alignment with the original insight of shocking 